The Events and Implications of Horatio Gates' Defeat at Camden. History of the United States, 512 American Revolution, Chase Ferguson, uh, July 4th, 2017. Um, I'm a Master's of History uh, student at Liberty University, and today we're going to talk about the Battle of Camden. There are a few guiding principles that I'd like to discuss before we get started. Liberty University's Department of History affirms that a biblical worldview should provide guidance in the analysis and interpretation of history. God is comprehensively sovereign over the nations, and a commitment to objectivity and honesty is essential to historical investigation. Background information on General Horatio Gates. Uh, some, some key things to keep in mind about him. He was a former major in the British Army, and he had served during the French and Indian War, where he had gained most of his, his experience prior to the Revolution. Also, uh, after the victory at Saratoga, uh, the Continental Congress appointed him to Major General during the War for Independence, and with the victory at Saratoga came a lot of confidence. Uh, he had an excellent reputation with Continental Congress because of that victory um, and routing the British there. Uh, however, according to um, A Glorious Cause by Middlecomp, one of the books that we've used in this class, uh, the, some of the soldiers could see through this um, facade um, of, a, of a real soldier. They, they would, they would kind of be able to tell that Horatio Gates, you know, may or may not have been the real deal when it came to uh, a soldier's general, uh, an officer um, that kept them in mind and at the forefront of his his uh, concerns and thoughts. So that was a small issue for some of the Continental soldiers. Another key player in this particular uh, campaign and battle, uh, General Cornwallis, um, otherwise known as Earl Cornwallis. He was a British commander for the Southern Campaign, beginning in Charleston and moving north uh, throughout the state of South Carolina and eventually North Carolina and Virginia. He had served as a general in the Seven Years' War, otherwise known as the French and Indian War, and of course the American War for Independence, otherwise known as the Revolutionary War, and the Third Mysore War, as well as the Irish Rebellion of 1798. General Cornwallis had a very, very long career, and he always uh, maintained favor within the British uh, government and those communities of the upper echelon. He was an educated aristocrat and definitely a professional soldier. So he fit the bill for leading the Southern Campaign and was a brilliant tactician. Um, and he was also very much a gentleman when it came to the treatment of other soldiers and the colonials as well, as he saw a need for that in the future. There are two gentlemen that must be discussed when we're talking about the side of the colonials, or otherwise known as patriots, uh, those men being General Thomas Sumter and Colonel Francis Marion. Um, Thomas Sumter was known as the Carolina Gamecock. Uh, Sumter served as a brigadier general for the uh, South Carolina militia, and he had a fierce reputation after the British had burned down his home. Um, there's been a lot of popular... Um, uh, media about it here lately, like the movie The Patriot, who's a combination of both of these characters and whatnot, but needless to say, uh, Thomas Sumter is definitely still very well respected, liked, and appreciated here in South Carolina, where I'm from. There are multiple schools named after him, uh, statues of him everywhere. He definitely um, served as a major mainstay in the actual backwoods fight against the British during the Southern Campaign, and he earned that name, the Gamecock, and as well as that's that's where uh, Sumter High School uh, got its got its mascot from, and of course the University of South Carolina, my alma mater as well. Francis Marion, another man from South Carolina, was known as the Swamp Fox due to his unusual guerrilla warfare tactics. Now he even went so far as to. Um, to, to really bring the fight specifically to uh, Colonel Tarleton, who was one of the uh, cavalry, uh, cavalry, excuse me, uh, officers in the British, and uh, he gained a lot of experience uh, just simply during his uh, fight in the French and Indian War and with the uh, War for Independence. He gained even more of a prowess in guerrilla warfare and tactics and unconventional asymmetrical warfare is what we might call it today. And even the United States Army Rangers of, of today credit uh, Francis Marion as being one of the, the founders of those concepts that the uh, Ranger Regiment, 75th Ranger Regiment, still embodies to this day. So very interesting gentleman from South Carolina and some people that I've always... Uh, always looked up to and, and been impressed with. So they can't uh, go without mentioning here when we talk about the Battle of Camden.
Now, of course, we cannot discuss uh, Colonel Francis Marion and uh, his exploits without mentioning Colonel Tarleton, uh, otherwise known as uh, the Green Dra Dragoon, which is a fancy way of saying cal cavalry. But having said that, he was a famous commander of the 1st Dragoon Guards, or the Green Dragoons, and in, he had an incredible reputation for brutality and, and a refusal to grant quarter. Um, and there was even a saying called Tarleton's Quarter, uh, which basically meant no quarter, and quarter being... Um, the respect or our um, duty that soldiers follow on the field of battle. Whenever they're surrendering troops, you should always yield to them and, and just take them captive and not use any weird brutal tactics or, or inhumane punishment. Uh, his cavalry unit was used to great effect during the Battle of Camden. Uh, Lord Cornwallis just orchestrated this entire battle very, very eloquently over the course of this center road that went through the battle and used uh, the, the cavalry troops to, to turn the flanks of, of the, uh, the Patriot forces, which were uh, largely made up of militia, and the, the cavalry just cut them down. Uh, Tarleton was never able to capture Francis Marion, however, which is, is, which is of important note. And I think that's something that always kind of bothered him. Um, Francis Marion, using that uh, asymmetrical warfare like we discussed in the previous slide, was simply able just to, to outmaneuver Tarleton when it came to um, non-battlefield type of warfare. Uh, Tarleton certainly had the upper hand with his um, well-regulated and disciplined soldiers when it came to open warfare, but in the guerrilla warfare, the, the Patriot cause in the South Carolina back, back country certainly had the upper hand. And now for a discussion about the battlefield at Camden in particular. It's located roughly five miles north of the city of Camden in Kershaw County, South Carolina. Um, it's a quaint little town. I go there often. Uh, needless to say, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful site. Uh, the battlefield is really something to see. There was approximately 2,100 British troops who had faced around about 4,000 colonial soldiers, the majority of which were militia. Now, this had been a concern during the um, War for Independence and militia lines seem to uh, be excellent at times and not not so excellent at others. Uh, needless to say, that was a, a big concern, and as you can see, almost two to one with the, uh, the colonials outnumbering the uh, British troops, but still there was definitely a British victory here. Camden was located on Cornwallis' path from Charleston into North Carolina because, as you know, he began his campaign down in Charleston, South Carolina, making his way um, through the Carolina backcountry, basically just trying to uh, strategically take over whatever he needed to to control the South. That was his job. He was sent there by Henry Clinton to control the, the South and, and bring the South back down to its knees so that that would give the uh, British in the North a chance to actually defeat and catch Washington. Uh, Cameron was strategically located uh, in, a, in a place where there was a crossroad section, which was a vital area to control in order to keep um, supplies, arms, munitions, and such, and things like that from getting to um, colonial soldiers in the South Carolina backcountry. So that's why this was such a strategic location and an important event and place uh, to take control of for the British. Now there's a particular piece of information about the battlefield at Camden that I think goes often overlooked. Um, the battle took place on either side of a roadbed running north towards North Carolina from the town of Camden that we mentioned in the previous slide. There were no open battlefields as often portrayed in, in, in modern media or just what one would normally think of when you think of a revolutionary or the war for independence battle. Uh, this didn't really exist. Uh, there were large stands of longleaf pine trees and savanna-like grasslands, and this is what constituted the battlefield at Camden. If you look at some of the images here on this particular slide, you'll be able to see um, the one directly above the text here. That's a, a rendition of what the lines would have looked like, and you see that... Uh, that um, vertical line that has a little bit of a diagonal direction dog leg in it that's the roadbed that would have been moving north from Camden towards North Carolina and that battle basically took place on either side and the uh, the troops were encircled by two bodies of water uh, creek beds basically nothing nothing too large but having said that they were basically in woods so if you look at the photographs on the right hand side you'll be able to see um, uh, an artist painting of the Battle at Camden, and you see the pine trees as well as savanna-like grasslands where the battle would have taken place, not some open field. And also there's a modern-day photograph 
um, on the bottom that shows you exactly what it looks like now today. And they've done a very good job of trying to recreate and, uh, and, and, and preserve what the battlefield would have looked like. And those longleaf pine trees create a canopy over the top of the grasslands, preventing any other uh, tall growth from occurring. So there's low-lying vegetation and a taller canopy. And it's something that's very unique to the Sand Hills region of South Carolina. And it's a beautiful place, something to definitely go see and check out. But it makes for a very unusual battlefield picture. Fortunately for the cause of liberty, there was a very short-lived British victory when it came to the Battle of Camden. While there were over 2,000 casualties suffered by the American forces and many, many, many um, soldiers captured, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000, along with seven artillery pieces that had been captured, um, this would not stand forever. And that's, that's one of the, the good things. Um, as far as a good outcome of the Battle of Camden. This served as an embarrassment for General Gates, which gave way to the um, advancement of Nathaniel Green, who had assumed command at the request of Washington. Actually, previously, well, George Washington wanted Nathaniel Green to, to uh, serve where Gates had, which potentially could have changed the outcome of the Battle of Camden. Yet, this definitely solidified Green's command, and this forced a significant recruiting campaign for the Continental Army Southern Campaign that was headed up by Nathaniel Green. This uh, bolstered the size of the Continental Army in the South, and under Green's leadership, they would see great success. In referencing the uh, previous slide, once again, with Green now in command of the Southern Campaign, it took a turn in favor of the colonists. Um, for instance, a good example would be the Battle of Calpins and Kings Mountain as well. These are great American victories, and they were certainly um, in partly due to uh, lessons learned at the Battle of Camden, and specifically the fact that Nathaniel Green is now taking control of the Southern Command. Um, the defeat at Camden ensured Green's advancement to be in charge of the Army in the South, and this directly influenced America's victory at Yorktown. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Yorktown is the location where General Lord Cornwallis um, surrendered his sword uh, uh, through, through a third party, granted, but surrendered his sword to George Washington, uh, signaling the end of the uh, war for independence. And arguably, without Green's command in the South and the aid of men like uh, Thomas Sumter and Francis Marion, America would probably not be the nation that it is today, and very possibly uh, would still be under some sort of British control or have been split up into various different different factions or states but needless to say we have the United States of America uh, due to the uh, military prowess of the leaders in the southern campaign and of course uh, Continental Congress and the uh, leadership of General George Washington in the north. In conclusion, these last two pages are simply my bibliography. Take a look at them. There were several very um, helpful books as well as academic journals that I read and several primary sources. Uh, take, a, take a sift through them and see what you find useful for yourself. If you're interested in South Carolina history, uh, certainly stay in contact with me. It was absolutely a pleasure learning and studying along beside everyone. Um, and I just have nothing but wonderful things to say about Liberty University and the process that we have here uh, learning about history. Uh, thank you guys. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the comment box below. Feel free to email me. Thank you guys and have a great day.